What's up, my ghosts and goblins? My name is Clint Hoagland, and this is Creating Electronic Music with Chuck. In our last video, we discussed a technique for cutting up samples, specifically geared toward cutting up breakbeats. In this video, we're going to talk about oscillator sync and how it can be used for modulation and also for what's called FM synthesis. In our previous videos, we've seen oscillator U-gens, and we've used Audacity to observe the differences between them. In the electrical world of analog synths, what oscillators do technically is supply a voltage that varies over time in a repetitive way. This has the effect, when that voltage is applied to a physical speaker, of creating a sonic tone at the frequency at which it repeats. The shape of that repeating variation creates different timbres, as we saw in the filters tutorial. The voltage that comes out of an oscillator can be used in another way, though. Other components in analog synthesizers use what's called control voltage to affect their behavior. Consider this sound, which we made in the filters tutorial. Essentially, what you are hearing here is a sawtooth waveform modulating the cutoff frequency of a low-pass filter. The rate at which the filter cutoff is repeating is the rate of the sawtooth wave. If we look at the math on that loop, that filter closes down once every 200 milliseconds. That is equivalent to 5 hertz. Now, we know that the lower limit of human hearing is above 5 Hz, so if you were to actually play a 5 Hz oscillator through a speaker, you wouldn't hear anything. For that reason, oscillators operating in this frequency spectrum are usually referred to as low-frequency oscillators, or LFOs for short. LFOs are a very common component in synthesizer design. They're great for modulating pitch, volume, filter frequency, or just about anything else that you can hear. There are a couple different ways you can apply an LFO's output to another UGen in Chuck, and today we're going to explore some of those. The first thing to know is that every UGen has an accessor method, or getter, called dot last. That dot last getter returns the most recent value of that UGen at that moment. Let's create a triangle oscillator, call it LFO, and set its frequency to 1 Hz. Then we'll make a while loop and send the oscillator's last value to the console, and send one millisecond to now. Let's check it out. You'll see that it's just sending zero to the console. This is because of a performance optimization in Chuck. UGENs have a rule that they don't process unless their samples are being used by another UGEN. That way, if you unchuck a UGEN in a Chuck script, you can keep it around to use later, and it won't cost you any compute cycles. Usually, the DAC serves as the downstream UGEN, but in this case, we don't want this LFO to go to the speakers, so we're going to use a special UGEN called Black Hole. Black Hole is a UGEN that is specifically for this purpose. It consumes samples from the UGENs chucked into it, but it just throws them away. That works around the requirement that UGENs stop if nothing is receiving their samples. So let's chuck our LFO into Black Hole and rerun our Chuck file. As you can see, it now outputs values between negative 1 and 1. Okay, now let's make another triangle oscillator and send that one to the DAC. Here's how it sounds. Now, one way we can make use of our LFO is just to mathematically use the dot last value from the LFO on the frequency of the oscillator. That looks like this. Let's hear what it sounds like. Now we can play with some numbers to make it sound like something a little more musical. 6 Hz is a pretty standard frequency for an LFO to create vibrato. We can turn down the amount of vibrato by dividing the value coming out of dot last by some number that we think sounds good. 40 sounds all right to me. Okay, so we've got our LFO affecting the frequency of our audible oscillator. Let's try it with some other oscillator shapes. Here's a square LFO. And here's a saw LFO. There's a couple of specialized oscillator types that are meant specifically for modulating other UGENs. The first is the phaser UGEN, which is like a saw oscillator, except instead of ramping from negative 1 to 1, it ramps from 0 to 1. The second is the modulate UGEN, which instead of a frequency parameter, has a vibrato rate, a vibrato gain, and a random gain. This is meant to create a more natural sounding vibrato than a regular sine or triangle LFO. I personally think it sounds weird and not natural at all, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't ever be useful. So if you keep in mind that oscillators just put out a value between negative 1 and 1, you can use that to control any other type of UGEN as well. Here's a sine oscillator modulating a pan 2 UGEN. Keep in mind that these LFOs are just oscillator UGENs themselves, and as such are also eligible to be controlled by other LFOs. Here I have a filter controlled by a sine LFO, and that LFO's frequency is governed by a second sine LFO. <laughs> 
So we've seen how we can utilize any ugens.last getter to modulate another ugens parameters. That opens up any number of creative possibilities. The chuck language, though, for convenience, also has an important feature built into its oscillator types. If you chuck one oscillator into another oscillator, and then chuck a two to the downstream oscillator's sync property, the first oscillator's frequency will modulate the frequency of the second oscillator. Let's see how that works. Here I've got two sine oscillators. Note that the first is not yet wired up to the second. Also note that chuck doesn't care about line breaks, and sometimes it can be advantageous to do your chucking together of ugens like this. Here's how the sound wave sounds by itself. Now I've chucked the first sine oscillator into the second. Note that the gain in the first sine is currently 1. It sounds exactly the same. Now let's change the gain on the first sine to 10. What we heard there is that it modulated the sine's frequency like we did earlier using the dot last property. This is a much more convenient way to wire two oscillators together. It also opens up another set of possibilities. Let's change the frequency of the modulation oscillator to 110. So that sounded a little different. Let's crank the modulation oscillator's gain to 100. What we just heard was something that sounded neither like a 220 hertz sine, nor a 110 hertz sine, nor really like those mixed together. Let's see what that looked like in Audacity. What we see here is that we have something that looks a bit like a sine wave, but which also has a periodic change to what we call the oscillator's duty cycle. This changes the timbre of the sound. Let's crank the modulator's gain to 500. What we hear is a sort of electric organ sound. If we look in Audacity, we see that our sine wave has been turned into something quite a bit more interesting and complex. Let's throw an ADSR in between our modulating oscillator and our second oscillator, and then throw a decay on there that makes it end halfway through our tone. What we heard there is a simple version of what's called FM synthesis. FM in this case stands for frequency modulation. This technique was invented by John Chowning at Stanford in the 1960s and is the basis for the sound architecture in the Yamaha DX7. The way sounds are structured in a DX7, sine oscillators are paired with ADSR envelopes, with each pair being referred to as an operator. Each sound in a DX7 consists of six operators interconnected with each other in various structures. As you can imagine, that gives a DX7 immense power to design sounds, while also being notoriously hard to wrap your head around. Up until now, we've only heard a modulator operator whose frequency has a simple relationship with the carrier's frequency, specifically 1 to 2. Let's see what happens if you choose a modulation frequency that has a less simple relationship to the carrier frequency. It results in a church bell sound that is not exactly musical, but certainly might be useful as a component in a larger sound design. FM synthesis uses a combination of operators with different frequencies and envelope times to create an unlimited number of potential sounds. At this point, you know enough to start experimenting with FM operators to design your own sounds, and I encourage you to do so. Try hooking them up to each other and to the carrier in different configurations, and use different envelope times and frequency combinations and see how they sound. In this tutorial, we talked about oscillator sync and how to use low frequency oscillators in Chuck, as well as how to experiment with FM synthesis. In our next video, we'll talk about classes and how they can be used to share information between Chuck files.